Hi, everyone. Hi, how are you? I'm well, how are you today? I'm okay. Stuck in quarantine, but okay. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. How are you feeling? I'm okay. I just came into contact with somebody that had COVID, so they have me in quarantine. I texted negative yesterday and they took two tests, but. Well, that's good. That's yeah. good. Yeah, it's better to be safe than sorry, you know, but it's still hard. Yeah, technically you can get it up to 14 days after coming in contact. Yeah, so that's exactly right. It's another strange thing about the virus that um, some people will only incubate it for like a couple of days and get sick. And other people, you know, it takes a full two weeks for them to know whether they're okay you know it's very strange yeah i think it has something to do with like immune deficiencies like your immune system can fight it for a certain amount of time and then if your immune system gets weak it infiltrates your body later than it does for people that already have a weakened immune system well and certainly um we know now that um different people have like um different populations of receptors, apparently. And so um, it's just easier for the virus to cause disease in some people than others. And um, it's very unusual, very unusual um, organism. So I'm, I'm guessing that the reason we don't have a lot of folks here yet is because I was on uh, Canvas uh, about an hour ago, and I was checking this. I was just double checking our schedule, our Zoom schedule, and there were all kinds of issues with it. So I tried to update it, and um, somehow I managed to delete a whole bunch of our scheduled lab meetings. So I was typing everything back in, and I I feel pretty sure that some people got just a whole heap of notifications on about Zoom being canceled or being added or being canceled or being added. And I fear that, uh, that some people may think that the lab was canceled today. Um, but anyway, what we'll do is we'll go ahead um, and meet today and um, record our meeting as usual um, for anybody who doesn't come in today. Um, so, um, I did want to remind everybody that, um, that there's a lecture exam today. If you haven't had a chance already to sit down and take it, uh, you'll want to do that, of course, before, um, eight o'clock tonight. Um, several people have already taken it and submitted it, so that's great. But if you haven't, just make sure you get that done this evening. Um, Looking ahead this week, uh, we don't meet. Um, we don't meet for our second. We don't meet on Thursday. Is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> um, we don't have any uh, lab on Thursday, and then a week from today, so next Tuesday, uh, you have your first uh, lab practical exam. Um, so very similar to the lecture exam. You know, you'll have from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m to take that exam um, and um, just at any point during the day when you have the time, you can sit down to take it. Um, it's based only on the material that we go through in lab. So the lecture exams cover just the lecture material, the lab practical exams cover just the lab material. We try to keep those two separate. Um, all right, so um, first and foremost, as usual, I just want to ask if anybody has uh, any questions about anything that you've been watching or reading or any quiz questions or anything um, that you might have questions about. Um, if you do, you can type them in the chat or since there's only a couple of us today, feel free to unmute yourself if you have any questions. Um, 
if anything doesn't make sense to you, remember you can always bring questions here to lab. Um, that's not a problem at all. I think what I'm gonna do, if you'll bear with me for just a moment. Oh, it's my dog. <laughs> she gets very loud, I'm afraid. Um, I'm gonna go ahead, again, if you'll bear with me for just a minute. And I'm gonna send out a very quick message. If I can, of course, it's not gonna let me do anything quickly. Here we go. So just bear with me, I'm just sending out a very quick announcement. Let anyone who, who's wondering whether we have a meeting. Generally speaking, I have um, I've had really good luck with Zoom in terms of um, you know just having it work and not getting kicked off of it too much <laughs> during during class meetings. But every once in a while, there'll be a weird scheduling issue with it. And um, generally, what I try to do is set up all of our Zoom meetings for the whole semester. Um, I get those set up in Zoom, and then I don't have to um, worry about that. But for some reason, when I went in today to check on that, to make sure everything was lined up, um, a several of our meetings had just been deleted. And I don't know if that's something that I did accidentally or um, if that was an issue in Zoom, but um, this technology, you know, we're so dependent upon it and it, sometimes it lets us down. So, all right, so I'm gonna go ahead and um, get started. And um, as I said, um, I sent out an announcement. So if, if some people come in a little bit late today, that's fine. Do me a favor, if you will, the, the folks that are here and just go ahead and type your name for me into chat. So I have that record. Um, and if anybody comes in late, then we will um, welcome them in. And um, again, I apologize for um, my part and any confusion about the scheduling. All right. So today we're gonna to be talking about a particular staining procedure that is very, very common in microbiology. It's used all the time and it's called gram staining. Now we have different types of staining procedures. Some of them are very simple and some of them are very complex. It just depends on what we're trying to stain. For example, we use what we refer to as simple staining procedures which involve one stain, just one, and they go ahead and they color everything on the slide, all of the cellular material, the exact same color. So if we wanna just know if we have cells present in a smear, or if we want to just um, you know, examine the general shape of cells or anything like that, these simple staining procedures are great. You choose a stain, um, you place it on top of the smear, and um, within about a minute, you've got a stained smear and you have cells that are quite visible and easy to see under the microscope. There are other times when what we're really trying to do is not only see what's on the slide, but we're trying to differentiate certain kinds of cells and certain kinds of organisms that are on the slide. So in those cases, instead of using one stain, instead of using a simple staining procedure, instead we go to what's called a differential staining procedure. And like the name suggests, these procedures are gonna help us differentiate sometimes between two different organisms and sometimes between different structures that are in or on cells. 
In a differential procedure, we actually use multiple stains. So these are the, the staining protocols that you have to know how long to leave the stains on and so on. They're a little more complex. But the nice thing is you end up with a smear where different cells are stained different colors or different parts of cells are stained different colors. And it helps you to see these differences much more clearly. So simple staining procedures, differential staining procedures. It all depends on whether you want everything colored one color or whether you want to apply multiple colors to different structures. This gram staining procedure that we're talking about today is a procedure that is differential. We're gonna apply multiple stains and chemicals. And we're doing this in an attempt to tell what we refer to as the gram status of an organism. Gram staining is gonna do something very important for us. It's going to be able to differentiate between what we call gram positive organisms and gram negative organisms. So it gives us the ability to know a, a very important characteristic about a microbe that, we're, that we are examining, that we're investigating. All of the bacteria, all of the many, many genuses and species of bacteria, they can all be broken down into either gram positive or gram negative with one exception that we'll talk about. So it's a, it's a sort of a first piece of information that we can gather about a bacterial cell and know a little something about that bacterium. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull up our slide set for today. Hopefully that's what you're seeing right now on your screen. The first slide says lab gram staining. And our objectives through this exercise are listed on this slide. We're gonna talk, um, I'll summarize again why we do gram staining, what the purpose of this procedure is for us. We'll talk about each one of the stains that's in the protocol or the procedure and what the role of that stain is. We'll talk about the steps of the procedure and then I'm gonna demonstrate those in pictures for you. And then we'll finish up by taking a look at some gram stained smears. And we'll uh, talk just a little bit about the limitations of gram staining because there are a couple of things we need to know about where gram staining can go wrong. So again, as I said just a moment ago, if we look at all bacteria, we can divide them into two big, big groups based on the anatomy of their cell wall. We can divide them into either gram positive or gram negative. Now this term gram, it gets a capital G because it's somebody's name. The scientist who developed this procedure um, gave it this name gram. So that's why gram always has a capital letter. Remember all bacteria have a cell wall that's made out of that very complex carbohydrate that we call peptidoglycan. Gram-positive bacteria have a very thick layer of peptidoglycan in their cell wall. Gram-negative bacteria are different. Gram-negative bacteria have a very thin layer of peptidoglycan. Now, as I said a moment ago, we're gonna determine through gram staining what we call the gram status of bacteria. And when I use that phrase gram status, I'm talking about figuring out whether an organism is gram positive or negative and determining what shape the bacteria has. So if I'm working in a laboratory as a technician and I am um, tasked with trying to determine the gram status of a microbe in a sample. On my report, I'm gonna 
um, next to gram status, I'm going to say not only whether it's gram positive or gram negative, but I'm also going to note its shape. So I might say gram positive caucus, or I might say gram negative rod. Um, gram status involves both of those things, the gram positive or negative part and the shape of the cell. We can use gram staining as, again, one of the first ways that we can identify a bacterium because we know, you know, the long, long list of microbes that are gram positive and the long, long list of microbes that are gram negative. So we use gram staining as part of that procedure in the laboratory of identifying unknown bacteria. Now on this slide, there's uh, an artist's drawing of the difference between gram positive and gram negative bacteria. Now what you're looking at here is just a little section that's taken from the cell. So you have to use your imagination here a little bit. If the whole cell was drawn, it wouldn't fit on the slide. This is just a little section that was cut out of that bacterial cell. So this right here represents the plasma membrane, the cell membrane. Again, just a little piece of it. You can see the circular heads and you can see the tails. So this represents the membrane. So that means this would be the inside of the cell over here. And this would be the outside environment over here. And I've got one piece of a gram negative cell and one piece of a gram positive cell side by side. So if you look at the gram positive cell first, here's that plasma membrane piece again. And then as we move out towards the environment, we bump into the cell wall. Remember bacteria are surrounded by this peptidoglycan material, which um, helps protect them because they are single celled organisms and they're very vulnerable to their environment. Now, what you're looking at here in purple represents peptidoglycan. So you can see there's a nice thick purple layer of material here, a nice thick layer of peptidoglycan surrounding the outside of this gram positive organism. Now over here in comparison, there is peptidoglycan, but it's drawn as a much thinner layer. So the primary difference between a gram positive and a gram negative cell, again, bacterial cell, is the thickness of the layer of peptidoglycan. It's very, very thick in gram positive organisms. It's very thin in gram negative organisms. Now there's additional structures in the gram negative bacteria that we need to be familiar with. You'll notice that this thin layer of peptidoglycan is drawn with these lines, these purple lines attaching it to a second membrane. And gram negative bacteria do in fact have a, a second, an outer membrane around their cell wall. This membrane again adds another layer of material outside of the cell itself to again, provide some protection. Now, the other thing to know about this outer membrane is this, see these little green structures that are sticking off? Remember, this represents the outside environment over on this side. So these green sort of spike structures, these are facing the environment. This is a molecule called lipo, polysaccharide. I have it written down on a, a slide coming up, but we, um, we often refer to this molecule as LPS instead of using that long-term lipopolysaccharide. This material is part of, it's, it's bound to this outer membrane in gram-negative bacteria. And again, it's, a, it's an important part of the, the strength 
of the entire outer layers around this cell. So to the gram negative bacterium, LPS is just a normal molecule for them. It's just part of their structure. But LPS is, a, is an important molecule for us in human medicine because it's actually toxic to humans. This LPS molecule also goes by a second name. It's referred to as endotoxin. What happens sometimes in humans and other animals, by the way, is that sometimes people get into disease processes where they've got something going on in their intestine and a large number of gram negative organisms die as a result. So remember your intestine is full of bacteria and other microbes. There are lots and lots of gram negative bacteria living in your intestine. They're not harmful to you. They just, they're part of your microbiome. And sometimes when we have intestinal illness, a large portion of those gram negative bacteria die as a result of that illness. And whenever a cell dies, it just degrades, it falls apart. And when these gram negative cells all die, this LPS molecule gets released and we tend to absorb it into our blood because it's not a great big molecule. And that's where the problems happen because LPS is toxic to us. So anytime that people experience this sort of a die off of gram negative bacteria because they have something, some kind of illness in their intestine, um, they often have um, a sort of a secondary effect of going into shock because they've got this toxic molecule in their bloodstream. It's a very interesting molecule. We, um, we've known about it for some time. Um, in veterinary medicine, it's particularly problematic for horses. Um, if you know anything about horses, you know that they have all kinds of problems with their gut. Horses get this condition that we sort of generally refer to as colic. And lots and lots of different things can cause colic, but they have this intestinal illness that goes on. And sometimes if the conditions are bad enough, large numbers of gram negative bacteria start to die in that horse's intestine. And the cells degenerate and the LPS gets released and the horse absorbs it and then crashes. They go into a shock state. You know, their blood pressure drops and they get very, very sick very quickly. So um, LPS is an important molecule in, in any kind of animal medicine, human medicine or other animal medicine, um, because it is toxic to us. The bacteria, it's just part of their body, but um, for us, it's toxic. All right. So let's talk now about the stains that we use for this gram staining procedure. So again, gram staining is considered a differential procedure because it uses multiple stains with multiple colors. Remember, it's also considered what we would call a direct staining procedure. When we use that word direct, we're saying that the staining is going to stain the cells. When you hear the term negative staining procedure, negative staining procedure, it means that the stain being applied is going to not stain the cells, but stain the background instead. It still helps us see the cells because the cells will be colorless on this colored background, but there are two different types of staining. So gram staining is considered direct because it stains the cells themselves. Multiple stains and a process called decolorization and counter staining. And we'll talk about what these terms mean next. So we have four chemicals that we're going to use. We have what's called crystal violet. 
we have Graham's iodine, we have decolorizer, which is just an alcohol, and we have safranin. Now, crystal violet is what we refer to as the primary stain of gram staining. When you apply crystal violet to a bacterial cell, it will bind to the peptidoglycan and it will turn it a purpley color. Some people see it as more of a blue color. So I always refer to it as being sort of a purple blue or a blue purple. We wash the grams, uh, sorry, we wash the crystal violet off after it's been sitting for um, a few seconds. And then we apply our second chemical. Now this second chemical is not a stain. It's a chemical called Graham's iodine, again, for that person's name. It's actually not iodine. It's not pure iodine anyway. It's iodine that's been mixed with other molecules to create what's called a mordant. If you've done any, if you've ever done any dyeing, you might know about mordants. Um, if you've ever uh, dyed fabric or if you've ever dyed yarn, um, there are lots of different uh, dyes available for those things. But anytime you apply a dye to something and you want that to stick, you want the color to really stick, you have to apply a chemical called a mordant. And what mordants do is they make the stain stick better. So what Graham's iodine does is it makes that crystal violet penetrate the peptidoglycan and really adhere to the peptidoglycan. It just helps it better um, bind to that peptidoglycan molecule. Now, after we wash off the Graham's iodine, we apply this decolorizer. And this is really the only difficult part of Graham staining. The decolorizer again is just an alcohol. And you may already know that when you apply alcohol to anything that's got stain or, or dye on it, you're gonna help pull that stain or dye away. You're gonna decolorize it. So the reason that the decolorizer is a little bit difficult is because you have to apply it for the right amount of time. You can overdo this. Um, so we'll talk about exactly how we apply this decolorizer. After we wash off the decolorizer, we put the last chemical on, and that's a stain called safranin. So our, our primary stain is crystal violet, and then the safranin is considered a counter stain. Safranin will stain uh, peptidoglycan a purpley pink color. Now, on this slide, it, we walk through the application of these four chemicals with a visual so we can help, uh, we can understand a little bit better what exactly is going on on the smear with the cells. So on the left side of this, you can see um, a circular uh, organism. They've labeled it gram positive. So we know that this caucus shaped cell is uh, gram positive. It has a thick layer of peptidoglycan. On the right hand side, we see a rod shaped cell and it's labeled gram negative. Now, as we go from top to bottom, we're working through gram staining. So remember, the very first thing that has to happen anytime you're gonna stain a smear of bacteria is you have to make the smear and you have to fix it. You have to adhere the cells to the glass slide. That's what we call fixing. Um, we can heat fix a slide to make the cells stick to it. And we can also do a chemical fixation using methanol, which is another kind of alcohol. It doesn't matter which one you use. I personally prefer using heat. I think it's easier and I think it works better. But both of those methods will fix the cells to the slide. They'll make the cells stick to the slide so they can be stained. Now we apply the crystal violet first. You can see both types of cells are gonna stain this purple color. 
whether they're gram positive or gram negative, it doesn't matter. Then we're going to rinse off that crystal violet and we're going to put the grams iodine on top of that smear. Now they've the artist here has shown that the color changes. You can see the it's still purple, but it's a different purple. I think the reason the artist drew it this way is because they're trying to drive home the idea that something is happening here, even though the cells are still going to be purple. Something is happening. The Graham's iodine is making that crystal violet really penetrate through the peptidoglycan and really adhere to that material. We wash off the Graham's iodine and then we do the decolorizer step. And here's where the change happens. We decolorize for a very short period of time, about 10 seconds. And instead of just applying a big puddle of this alcohol on top of the cells, we drip the alcohol over the cells, just drip, drip, drip for 10 seconds. Now what's gonna happen is, both of these cells ha are, have been stained with crystal violet, but remember the gram negative cell only has a thin layer of peptidoglycan. The gram positive cell has a thick layer. So with the limited decolorization, we're gonna remove all of the crystal violet from the gram negative cell. We're only gonna remove some of the crystal violet from the gram positive cell. That's going to leave the gram positive cell purple, and it's going to take all the color out of the gram negative cell. The next and last step of gram staining is putting the safranin on. Remember, we call safranin a counter stain. And the reason it gets that name is because it's going to counter any cell that has lost its primary stain. And sure enough, it'll stain this gram negative cell a pink red color, but it doesn't do anything to the gram positive cell because this cell has already been stained with crystal violet. So it can't take up any of the safranin. So at the end of gram staining, uh, any gram positive cells are gonna be purple and any gram negative cells are gonna be pink. On this slide, um, don't try to write any of this down, but um, on this slide, you have the whole gram staining procedure that I've just described all written out for you. So if you need to go back and look at it, you have it right here on one slide all written out. Um, the only other things that are on this slide that I haven't said so far are the times. So you can see right here after you um, prepare the smear and heat fix it, you put the crystal violet on and you're gonna let it sit for 30 seconds. Now, this is not a time critical procedure. There are lots of protocols in biology where you have to do things for exactly a certain number of seconds or you'll completely ruin your experiment. But gram staining isn't like that. So if you leave the crystal violet on for, you know, 28 seconds or 33 seconds, it's not going to ruin anything. It's approximately 30 seconds. After we leave it for 30 seconds, we're going to gently rinse it off with distilled water. It's important to use distilled water because this distilling process makes sure that the water is pure, that it doesn't have any microbes in it that might contaminate our slide. Next, we're going to apply the Graham's iodine. And just like with the crystal violet, we're going to let it sit for 30 seconds, approximately, and then we're going to rinse it off. Now, here's that decolorizer step. We're gonna apply the decolorizer drop by drop, and I'll show you this in the demonstration, for 10 seconds only. We literally count out 10 seconds. And we're gonna let that decolorizing liquid, that alcohol liquid run off the slide as we do this. And then we're gonna rinse again with distilled water. And then we're gonna apply that safranin, that counter stain. 
Now this one, we have to leave on a little bit longer. This one you wanna leave on for about 60 seconds. It just takes a little bit longer for it to bind. We're gonna rinse one last time and then we're gonna blot the slide and we're gonna take a look at it. So it's not a really complicated procedure as long as you know um, a few of the timing details, um, it's not hard to do gram staining. And you know, as, as you go from uh, one lab to another lab, um, sometimes people tweak gram staining a little bit. You know, maybe in one lab, they like to leave the crystal violet for 40 seconds. And in another lab, they might like to leave the saffron in for two minutes. Again, the timing isn't really strict. The only timing that is important, really important is the decolorizing time because it's possible to decolorize too much. Remember, alcohol takes stain away. So if we allow that smear to sort of sit in decolorizer for too long, even the gram positive cells will lose all of their crystal violet. And then what's gonna happen is they will pick up the safranin and you're gonna think you have a gram negative organism when it really is gram positive. So you do have to be careful with the decolorizer. All right, um, the next thing I'm gonna do is just walk through some uh, slides that show us visually this procedure going on. So this will be our demonstration. Uh, in this first slide, you can see uh, the wire on an inoculating loop. Here's the loop at the end. Remember, this is the tool we're gonna use to pick up our bacterial cells out of a tube, a culture tube that's full of culture media and has bacterial cells growing in it. This is the incinerator device that um, is often used in micro labs in order to uh, sterilize this loop. Remember with an incinerator, we place the wire part of the loop down into this tunnel here and we heat this loop up till it's red hot and we sterilize it. So here's this first step where I'm gonna gather some cells and I'm gonna make a smear on a microscope slide. You'll notice that I'm gloved because of course we only ever handle culture containers with a gloved hand. So this is a test tube, a glass test tube. It contains some kind of a broth in it, a nutrient broth. And this is culture media. This has got all the nutrients in it that bacteria need to grow. So this tube was inoculated with some kind of bacterium. And then it was put into the incubator for about 24 hours. So that's how long it takes to grow most bacteria to a good level. And now I'm ready to take some cells out. It's important that I, when I take a tube of culture material like this out of the incubator, it's important that I mix it up before I draw my sample out. And it's also important that I put my loop in right, right in the middle of the volume of fluid in here. In other words, I don't wanna just stick it in right underneath the top or stick it all the way to the bottom. It's just best practice to put my loop down about halfway. That's gonna put some cells into this loop area for me and then I can withdraw. Uh, I can take my inoculating loop back out. Notice that as I gather cells from this culture tube, I'm holding the culture tube at an angle. And I'm also holding the cap for the tube in my hand. This is important. This is aseptic technique. Remember microbes don't fall, uh, sorry, microbes don't fly, they fall. So I never wanna open up a culture tube while I'm holding it straight up and down because that's just inviting some dust particles with microbes attached to fall into this tube and contaminate it. So anytime I open up a broth tube like this, I wanna hold it at an angle and I wanna keep that cap in my fingers 
and not put it down on the desk because we always have to assume that the desktop is contaminated. So if I set this cap down on the desk and then put it back on my tube, I might be contaminating my tube. Now, once I take the cells out, I just make my smear. You'll notice that I have a glass slide here thoroughly labeled. I have my initials and the date. I have the name of the organism. Um, you want to put as much information as you can on anything that you're making in the lab so that if someone other than you were to pick it up, they would know exactly what was on it. Once we stain slides, we can keep them. We've, we've attached the cell to the slide and we've killed the cell with the stain. So we can keep stained microscope slides for quite a long time. So they need to be carefully labeled. Now notice the way I'm moving my loop. I'm making wider and wider circles here as I um, apply the cells to the slide. What I'm doing is I'm just starting in the center and then I'm making wider and wider circles. Sorry, it's, it's uh, glitching a little bit. This is me smearing the cells through about the center third of the slide. That's about how spread out you want a loop full of bacterial cells to be so that it fills the center third approximately. Now, this, um, this smear of cells that I've just made, it needs to sit and dry for a few minutes. I need the wet, the liquid from the broth culture to dry I don't want to uh, heat fix this slide until it's perfectly dry. Now I can heat fix a slide using an open flame. I can pass the slide through the open flame. That will be enough heat to make the cells stick to the slide. But if you don't have an open flame available and you have one of these incinerators instead, you can also use this. These incinerators get very, very hot, but the most of the heat is held on the inside. This outer casing, this is aluminum, it will get hot, but it's not too, too hot. So it makes a great place to heat fix your slide. You can see I'm holding the slide using a clothespin. That's just for safety purposes. I don't want my little fingers to get too close to this hot metal. And I'm literally just laying the glass slide against this aluminum, this hot aluminum. And I'm gonna leave it there about 20 seconds. That's gonna heat these cells up. It's literally gonna cause the proteins in the membrane of the cells to begin to denature and it makes them a little sticky. And that's gonna attach the cells to the glass slide if I don't do this, and then I try to stain those cells, I'm just gonna wash the cells right off the slide. So we always, always have to heat fix or chemical fix these cells to the slide before we stain them. Now remember, we don't ever heat fix a wet smear. And there's a reason for that. If I took this slide when it was still wet and I, heat fixed it like this. The potential is there for me to aerosolize these cells. Remember, they're not stuck to the slide quite yet. And if I put heat on this wet uh, cell mixture, I may send those cells up into the air in some water vapor. And that would be dangerous to myself and to other people in the lab. I want to make sure that this slide is bone dry before I heat fix it so that I don't accidentally send these cells up into the air and somebody accidentally inhales them. Um, remember, most of what we handle, not pathogenic, but we always behave as though what's on our slide is dangerous because that way we will use the maximum amount of safety. Um, so. 
We, we want to make sure that our smears are dry before we um, heat fix them. Okay. So now I have not one, but three heat fixed smears here. Um, you'll notice I drew a, a circle with a Sharpie around the area where I placed the, sl uh, the cells. Um, especially when you're first learning how to make smears and how to stain smears. A lot of students like to do this because when they go to the microscope, once they're all done and they go to the microscope to examine what they've made, it makes it easier to find the cells. It's just hard. Cells are very small and they're hard to find on these great big microscope slides. So at least while you're learning, it's very helpful to draw a Sharpie circle and then put all your cells right here inside that Sharpie circle. Again, about the middle third of the slide is the size you wanna go for. Oh, the other thing I wanted to say was when we work in the microbiology lab, it's very common for us not to have one slide that we need to stain, but to have multiple slides. You know, if you're working in a busy lab, you may need to gram stain, you know, a dozen samples in a day. So it's very common for technicians to make multiple slides all at the same time. All of the slides get prepared. In other words, the smears get made and then all of the slides get brought through the staining procedure at the same time. Now on this slide, you're seeing a very high tech piece of equipment that we call a staining tray. These come in all shapes and sizes because they're homemade. All this is is a plastic box, you know, a plastic food container with the lid removed. And I've just cut holes in the sides and I've just threaded through some zip ties. What I've done is I've created a place I can set my slides on top of the zip ties that's going to suspend them over this container. Now, why would I want to do that? Well, remember, the stains that we use in the microbiology lab are hazardous material, all of them. We don't want to ever let these stains go down the drain. So while we're using them, we gather them in a container, in a waste container, basically. And then once I'm done for the day, I just empty out my stain tray into the hazardous waste bottle in the laboratory. That way um, I keep track of any stain and any other staining chemicals that I'm using. So very low tech, but very effective while you're staining. Now gram staining is such a popular procedure in microbiology and in other labs that we can buy gram staining kits. You don't have to buy each chemical individually. You can buy a kit. And that's what you're looking at here. All of the chemical supply houses that um, where you can buy laboratory supplies have gram staining kits available. This one happens to be from uh, Becton Dickinson. Um, they usually sell these stains in liter bottles. So it's a lot of material. It'll last a while, which is good. They're not super expensive, which is also good. Um, so very, very common to see these big bottles of gram staining um, chemicals in the laboratory. All right, so I've got three slides suspended over my staining tray in this picture. I made the three smears and then I heat fixed them. And now I'm ready to gram stain them. So you can see I'm using a plastic pipette here. I drew up my first stain, which is crystal violet. And I've just flooded the smear with crystal violet. It's really important that you're not stingy with these stains. You wanna put plenty of stain over your smeared area. And that's to ensure that you get all of the cells stained. These stains, again, are not super expensive, so it's absolutely better to put on too much than too little. I'm gonna let the crystal violet, this primary stain, sit for about 30 seconds. 
then you can see I've picked the slide up here with my, again, with my clothespin, so I don't have to touch it with my fingers and get stain all over myself. I'm just angling the slide down over the stain tray and I'm just rinsing it with a little bit of distilled water. We often use these uh, plastic bottles in the laboratory, you've probably seen them, that we can fill with distilled water and they have these nice curved spouts on them. So we can rinse the slides off with plenty of distilled water and all of the waste stain just goes right into our staining tray. Now I want you to notice that after I've washed off the crystal violet, I'm not gonna see purple here. Sometimes when students first look at their smear, they get very worried. They think, oh, maybe, maybe I didn't heat fix my cells good enough. And, and maybe they all washed off into the staining tray. Remember these stains that we use for gram staining are direct stains. They are staining the cells, not the background glass. The cells are very, very small. They're microscopic. So you are not gonna see purple on your smear. You're just not, you're not gonna see anything. And that's perfectly normal. In fact, if you make a smear and you put the first crystal violet on and when you rinse it, the whole thing looks purple you've probably got way too many cells on your slide and it's gonna be hard to examine it. Remember the second chemical is your mordant. And in this case, it's called Graham's iodine. It's gonna help the crystal violet penetrate and adhere to the peptidoglycan. So I'm gonna put that on top of the three slides. And again, in a nice big puddle, and I'm gonna let that sit for about 30 seconds. I'm gonna use my distilled water and I'm gonna rinse that off down into the staining tray. Now comes the decolorizer. This is the step that drives students crazy because like I said, it's sometimes easy to overdo this step. When we decolorize, we don't lay the slides down on the zip ties. We don't lay them on the shelf. Instead, we pick them up again with the clothespin, hold them at an angle over the staining tray. You use a transfer pipette and you draw up the decolorizer and you're gonna apply it for 10 seconds in droplets. So take a look at this. I'm literally just putting drip, drip, drip over that smear. Notice I'm moving the pipette back and forth so that I'm sure that I'm covering the entire smear, but I'm counting to 10. One, two, three, four, five, drip, drip, drip over the surface of that smear. And then that's it. That's all I do. You'll often see some purple color rinsing off into the staining tray. That's normal because this decolorizer is pulling some crystal violet out, right? It's gonna pull all of the crystal violet out of the gram negative cells because they only have a thin layer of peptidoglycan. It's gonna pull some of the crystal violet out of the gram positive cells, but not all of it. And that's important. Very, very important after you decolorize that you rinse again. This is another step that sometimes gets forgotten. It looks so clean and clear. Students think, oh, I'm ready for my next step. But you have to rinse the alcohol off with distilled water or else it stays on too long and it will pull all of the crystal violet out. So you have to remember to rinse after each one of these steps. The last um, step here, or the second to last step, I should say, is the safranin. This is a beautiful stain. Um, it's got this really deep pinkish red color. Again, you wanna flood the slide, make sure your smear is totally covered. Let the safranin sit for at least 60 seconds. 
It just needs a little extra time to adhere to the cells. I'm going to rinse and then I'm going to blot. This is that very thick, heavy paper that we use in the microbiology lab called bilbis paper. It's just a thick absorbent paper. So I lay the slides down on it. I fold the piece of paper over and I just blot them dry. The only thing to remember when you blot slides is you don't wanna rub them dry because you can just physically rub the cells off of your microscope slide. So we just wanna blot them dry. It's okay if they don't get 100% dry. We just wanna get most of the water off of the smears. So you can see these slides, they, they look kind of messy. They've got like some smears of purple and a little pink on them. Sometimes a little bit of color gets retained on the smear. You know, they're not neat looking, but these are fully gram stained now and they're ready to be examined. So what, we're, what we would do at that point is head over to the microscope. Now, remember, we don't keep our gloves on when we use a microscope. And the reasoning behind that is that we assume our gloves are contaminated. Remember, I held that culture tube with those gloves on and I took cells out of that tube and I made a smear. So my gloves could very well have bacteria on them. So I don't wanna go over and use my microscope with my gloves on because my microscope is not routinely disinfected. So gloves off. Those slides are no danger to me anymore because the, the cells have been heat fixed and they've been stained. And both of those things will kill cells. So the cells that are sitting on those slides now are dead. They are no danger to me at all now. So gloves off at the microscope. All right, this is what we're hoping to see when we gram stain a smear. Now, this happens to be a smear that was made with two different organisms. So this wasn't a pure culture of one genus and one species. This was a combined sample that had two different types of bacteria in it. And it just makes a really good example of gram staining because you can see both colors on this slide. Remember, the whole purpose of gram staining is that we wanna determine the gram status for a particular kind of bacteria. If it stains purpley blue, we know it's gram positive. If it stains pinkish red, we know it's gram negative. When we report gram status, we wanna say whether or not it's positive or negative and what shape it is. So this purple cell here has one shape and this pink cell has another shape. We are looking here on this particular smear under the 100X objective lens. So we're at a thousand times mag total magnification. This purple cell is round. This is a caucus and it has stained a nice deep purple color. So this is a gram positive caucus. You can see there are lots of individual cells on the slide. They're kind of grouped together, but I can see that each cell is circular. Now take a look at the pink cell. It looks very different. This is a rod shaped cell. If you look right in the center here, you can see two cells, they're head to tail here, but these are two individual rods. They are clearly stained pink. So these are gram negative. Does everybody see that? Do you see the difference in the colors? It's pretty stark. It's pretty clear when you first see it. Um, 
it's not hard to tell the purple from the pink, um, which is good because it makes our work a little bit easier. Um, does everybody see the shapes on that slide? Or should I say, does anybody not see the shapes on that slide? What do you think? Clear? Okay, good, good. All right, let's take a look at some more. On this smear, we can also see two different organisms. Now, when you look, it's very evident that one of these organisms has stained a purple color and one has stained a pink color. So this particular smear was made from a sample that was gathered from a patient. In other words, this was not taken from a culture that was purposefully grown up in the laboratory. Remember, when we make cultures in the laboratory, we're growing pure cultures. We're growing one organism at a time. When you see smears like this, you know that it came from some sample. It might have been a sample from a patient. It might have been an environmental sample. But there are two different organisms on this smear. Now, they're both the same shape. What shape do you see? Go ahead and type it in the chat for me. Is this, do these look like cocci? Do these look like rods? Do these look like spiral shapes like spirillum? Do these look like uh, comma shapes to you? Try to find an individual cell somewhere. Like here's a nice purple cell right here. The pink are a little harder to see individually, but here's one of them here. Here's one of them right here. What do you think for shape? Go ahead and type it into the chat for me. Circular, rod shaped, spirilla. Remember that's the twisted one. Vibrio or comma shaped. Good, Morgan, you've got it. Good, good, Davina. Rod shaped, right? These are rod shaped. And remember um, the term rod and the term bacillus are the same. It's, it's kind of unfortunate because the word bacillus is also the name of a genus of bacteria. <laughs> but technically speaking, the term bacillus means rod. So some people call rod-shaped bacteria rods. I tend to do that. Some people call rod-shaped bacteria bacilli. Um, either one is fine. So we have two rod-shaped organisms. One of these rods is gram-positive. One of them is gram-negative. You know, um, when we gram stain, sometimes we get accustomed to seeing the same shape with one particular gram stain result. So for example, it's very common to see gram positive cocci. It's very common to see gram negative rods. But any combination is possible. So there are gram positive cocci. There are also gram negative cocci. There are gram positive rods. There are also gram negative rods. Gram positive spirillum, gram negative spirillum. You see all different combinations. The important thing to remember is that when you report the gram status, you report it as both positive or negative and the shape of the cell. Now take a look at this slide. These are two pure cultures. So these were grown up in the lab. Up at the top um, and down at the bottom, um, we have an individual organism visible. This slide is under the 40X lens. 
This slide is under the 100X lens. And I put these two side by side because I want to show you the difference here. Remember, we can see bacteria under the 40X lens, but we can see them a lot better under the 100X. So yes, I can look at this smear here and I can say, well, that's definitely purple. <laughs> that's a gram positive organism. I can also tell that the, slide, uh, that the cells are cocci. I can see these little dots. I can see these little circles. I can't see them very well, right? But I can tell that these are little circles, lots and lots and lots, hundreds and hundreds of little circles on this slide. So yes, you can determine gram status under the 40X lens, but I don't recommend it. I recommend that we always go up to the 100X lens. It doesn't add that much more time to your work and you'll get a much clearer image of the cell shape. So the slide on the top here, these are gram positive, purple positive, cocci, circular or spherical cells. It happens to be Staphylococcus. Now you wouldn't be able to look at this and know that this was Staphylococcus. I just happened to know what I was growing in the tube. So that's how I know it's Staphylococcus. Remember, sometimes the name of the organism gives us a little bit of a hint about its shape, right? It doesn't tell us whether it's gram positive or gram negative, but we can get a hint about its shape. So Staphylococcus and Streptococcus, those are both coccus shaped bacteria. And any bacteria that has a genus name of Bacillus is a rod shaped bacteria. That's what we have down at the bottom here. This is a Bacillus species. This one is under a 100X objective lens, the oil immersion lens. And I think you can see that these are rod shaped. Now, the other thing I wanna point out on this slide, remember that the way we write scientific names matters. We always write the genus and then the species, but it is possible instead of writing out the actual species name, it's possible to just write SPP. That means species. In other words, I'm saying this is a Staphylococcus species. I'm not naming the species. I'm just naming the genus. Now, if I were gonna write this out, the full name, remember you always give the genus name a capital letter and the species name begins with a lowercase letter. I can write out the whole genus name or I can write out the first initial with a period. Always capitalize though for the genus. And then when I, when, however I write it out, I can either italicize the name like I have here, or I can underline both terms. That's the correct way to designate a scientific name. All right. We are under the 100X lens here. So we're at 1000X total magnification. Take a look at this one. And then in the chat, I want you to tell me what the gram status is. Remember, we're looking at color first. That's gonna tell me gram positive or gram negative. And then we also wanna report the shape. What do you think? Take a look at it again. Do we have a gram positive organism here? Do we have a thick layer of peptidoglycan here? Or is this a gram negative organism? Is this an organism that has a very thin layer of peptidoglycan? And what shape are these cells? There are many, many, many individual cells visible here. 
Let me think. Good job, Morgan. That's exactly right. Gram positive, purple, and caucus or cocci, that's the plural for caucus. This is a gram positive cocci. I wanna show, show you something else that's visible in this slide. It's not part of gram status. We don't report it as part of gram status, but it is a piece of information. I want you to notice how a lot of these cells have grouped together. Some of them have really clumped together, right? There's a big clump right here. There's other clumps here, there's one here. But even where it's not really clumped up, these cells are sort of grouped together. See that right there? And then there's another group right there. The way organisms associate with each other in a culture can tell us something about them. Not always, but some bacteria behave a certain way. And um, it's related to the fact that they are a population, they're a community. So some types of bacteria like to gather in groups. It's very strange, but it's true. This is a feature that's very common in staphylococci for whatever reason, and I can't tell you why they do it, but for whatever reason, they just like to hang out in these groups, in these clusters. Some people call these grape-like clusters, just like a, a big bunch of grapes in your hand. And it just turns out that that's a feature that we see in Staphylococcus. So if I have a gram-positive coccus and I see that clustering feature, I can't say for sure that it's Staphylococcus, but I'm suspicious that it's Staphylococcus when I see that. All right, here's your next one. Now this smear was not made from a culture. This was a patient sample. So I only see one kind of organism on here, but it came out of a patient. One of the ways you can tell that you don't have a pure culture is because the background has stained, hasn't it? The background is pink. Normally when I make a gram stained smear from a pure culture, I expect the background to be white. What I see here, this pink, that's because these cells were not grown up in broth, in culture. These cells came out of a patient's body. And this material on the back of the slide is picking up stain. This could be like mucus, it could be blood, although it's not blood. It could be uh, tissue fluid. Um, Anytime you make a smear directly from a patient sample, you're gonna get some color in the background as well. But I want you to look at the cells and I want you to tell me what the gram status is. Again, gram positive or gram negative and shape. Put it right in the chat for me. What do you see? Color first, purple for gram positive, pink for gram negative, and then the shape of the cell. Here, I'll put it up again. We're not looking at the background, we're looking at the cells. Cells, cells, cells. Do you see purple or do you see pink? Remember the purple, some people call it a blue. The pink, some people call it a red. What color are those cells? You got it, Morgan. That's a gram positive again. Those are purple cells and those are round cells. They also happen to have a very noticeable arrangement to them, don't they? These cells, these cocci, these gram positive cocci have arranged themselves in these chains, haven't they? Remember the best way to find cell shape when you look at a smear 
is to look for an individual cell somewhere. I can see one right here. I can see one cell right there. Over here, I see two cells side by side. Here's two cells right here. But I have lots of these long chains of cells. See that? Gosh, there are probably 20 cells, maybe 30 cells in that chain. This is another one of those grouping arrangements that we see in some organisms. This is a classic arrangement for a type of bacteria called streptococci or streptococci. They love to get in these long chains. So again, if I see that, if I see a gram positive caucus and it's in a chain, I can't say for sure that it's streptococcus because some other organisms will make chains, but I'm very suspicious that it's streptococcus, especially, you know, if a doctor said to me uh, or a nurse said to me, uh, this was taken from the back of somebody's throat and they have a sore throat <laughs> and I see a gram positive caucus that has arranged itself in chains, I'm very suspicious that that is a streptococcus organism. Good. All right, this is a, another example of the difference between a patient sample and a pure culture. Now, both of these were taken under the 40X lens. So again, the cells are very small. I'd be much better off looking under the 100X lens, but it's really the background I wanted to show you here. This background is just lovely and white, and that's because this was a pure culture. These were cells that were growing in a broth tube with culture medium. And I took some out and I smeared them onto the slide and I got this after I gram stained it. The cells are dark purple, that's gram positive. It's very hard to see at this magnification, but these happen to be cocci. Over here, this came from a patient or you know, it could have come from an environmental sample as well. In other words, it wasn't grown up in the lab. So I get this pinkish coloration in the back. That's because there's some kind of other material on this slide besides these purple colored bacteria. This also happens to be a gram positive caucus. Again, it's hard to tell at this magnification, but I think you can see it. I think you can make out that each individual cell here is round. Now, this is that clustering arrangement again. See this right here? That's a cluster of four cells right there. And then I've got all these other grape-like clusters of cells. But I can see individual cells. Here's one right here. Here's another one right here. So I can tell that these are spherical. These are circular or cocci. And they've got a purple color. So they're gram positive. Mm, how about this one? Gram positive, gram negative, and shape. What do you think? Try to find an individual cell. If you can't, try to find a location on the slide where maybe there are two cells or maybe three cells and see if you can determine the shape from that. Gram positive or gram negative and the shape Yep, Davina's got it. Rod shaped, gram positive, gram negative, Davina? What do you think? Purple or pink? Let's look at it again. This one is a nice dark purple, right? This is a nice purple. This is a gram positive rod. And here's something very unusual. This image, was taken under the 40X lens. These cells are enormous, relatively speaking. So if I was looking at this and I couldn't really tell, gee, are these 
are these circles or are they rods? I, would, I wouldn't look here, I'd look somewhere else. Right here, I can see two rods head to tail. And if I look at this chain right here, I can really see the rod shape. There's one, two, three, four, five cells. They're all head to tail here. They're in a chain. This is an organism that's called Bacillus megaterium. <laughs> it got the megaterium name because it's mega, it's huge. It's about a hundred times bigger than an E. coli cell. So very, very big organism, which is nice because we can see it a little more easily. And this particular organism is another one that likes to arrange itself and it builds these long chains. So it's a gram positive rod, that would, that's its gram status. And I also just know that if I see those chains like that, um, that's a feature for this particular species of bacterium. So it gives me a little more evidence for what it is. So again, I can't look at this and know for sure that this is Bacillus megaterium. Can't do it. I have to do further testing. But I can say that it's a gram positive rod. And that's a piece of information that will help me as I identify further and further characteristics in the laboratory. On this slide, you're just, you're looking at the exact same organism. It's just that this image was taken under the 40X lens. This image was taken under the 100X lens. See how much easier it is to see the shape over here on the, on the right. You can still see the color on the left, right? I can still see pink over here. So I can tell that this is gram negative because it's pink. But I need to go up to the 100X oil immersion lens before I can really see the rod shape. Now this is E. coli. And I will tell you that E. coli has a very, um, I'll call it a stubby shape. It is rod shaped. Here are two E. coli cells, head to tail. But these rods are not very long. They're kind of short and squat. If you compare them to these rods, these rods are much longer than these rods are. They're just a little bit stubby and that's a feature of E. coli. A gram negative rod, and it happens to be a short rod. Now, there's no arrangements that are associated with E. coli. So sometimes when you look at a slide, you might say, oh, I, I, see a, I see a chain here. It only has two cells in it, but it looks like a chain. But it's just not a feature for this organism. E. coli just doesn't have a particular arrangement that it tends to get in under the microscope. Both of these were taken with a 40X lens. Look at the size difference between the cells. These cells, I mean, they look tiny. These cells look much bigger. This is that Bacillus megaterium organism again. Gram negative, because it's pink. Gram positive, because it's purple. Very hard to see, but these are rods. These are also rods. Gram negative rods, gram positive rods. Again, I would have a much easier time seeing the shape, especially of these cells, under the 100X lens. All right, the last thing I wanna talk about today about gram staining is the limitations of gram staining. It's a great technique. And like I said, it's very popular we use it all the time in the laboratory, but it has some limitations and I have them listed on this slide. The first and most important limitation of gram staining is this. Gram staining is best accomplished with a fresh specimen. So if I'm gram staining a culture that I made in the lab, 
I need it to be less than 24 hours old. You can keep bacterial cells alive in a culture for a couple of days, you know, even three or four days. But what's happening inside that culture, whether it's a tube of broth or a plate of auger, what's happening is those cells, as they keep growing and they keep dividing, they're running out of nutrients and they're getting crowded. They're excreting waste products into the culture and those are toxic. So as the culture gets old, the cells get less and less healthy. And usually what we do, if we have a culture that's a few days old, if we wanna keep it going, what we'll do is we'll get a fresh culture container, we'll take a few cells out of the old culture and we will inoculate the fresh culture with them and put it back in the incubator and keep those cells going. So the general rule is if I'm using a culture that I've grown up in the lab and I wanna gram stain it, it needs to be less than 24 hours old. If it's older than that, I run the risk of getting a really poorly stained smear because the cells just aren't healthy. If I'm using a patient sample or an environmental sample, you know, the same thing goes. The fresher, the better. Don't use old cells because they don't gram stain very well. And you're going to get these weird results. Let me show you. Take a look here. This is the best slide I have of this effect. So if you look at this slide, this smear, this is taken under a 100X lens. And I think if you look at it carefully, you're gonna see, not only do I see some purple on this slide, I can see a lot of purple right there. I can see purple here and here. I see purple, but I also see pink. And it's not that I have two different organisms on here. No, I can see sometimes the same cell staining both purple and pink. For example, if you look at this cell right here, I see purple on each side and a pink in the middle. Same with this one right here. Purple at each end, pink in the middle. The same cell is staining both colors. That's not what gram staining should look like. Now there's something else visible on this slide. Some of these cells have areas in them, have regions in them that aren't purple or pink. Look at this. This is one cell right here. It has purple on both ends and it has white in the middle. Can you see that? That's a cell that has started to sporulate that white structure in the middle is gonna be the spore. It doesn't pick up any stain. These spores don't pick up stain. You have to use a very special stain to turn them colors. If you look around, you can see these white structures. Here's another one right there in the middle of that cell. If I keep looking around, here's one right here, a white structure in the middle of a cell. Here's another one over here. This culture is old enough now that these cells are sporulating, they're stressed. I cannot determine gram status from this smear. I know that I don't have two organisms because if I did, I would see a whole bunch of cells that are all stained purple and I would see a whole bunch of cells that are all stained pink, but that's not what I see. I see individual cells that are both purple and pink. That tells me that this is an old culture. The other giveaway here is that the sporulation has started. Remember, there are two genuses of bacteria that we need to know about that can sporulate. Bacillus and Clostridium. 
bacillus and clostridium. Those are the sporulators. When they get stressed out in a culture, they're gonna sporulate. They're gonna go into that inanimate form, that spore that doesn't need any food. It doesn't need any water. It doesn't metabolize. It just lays low until the conditions get better. And once it has more water and more food and a better temperature and so on, it will revert back to a cellular form. When you see spores in a culture, you know that that culture is stressed out. And one of the big reasons they get stressed is because the culture is old. There are two things, two things that are most responsible for making a bacterial cell sporulate. One is drying out. Now that's not the case in a culture, but certainly out in the environment. If it starts to dry out, it will sporulate. And if it runs out of nutrients, it'll sporulate. Now in our culture containers, obviously it's not that they're running out of water, but they are running out of food. More and more cells are growing in the same volume of media. More and more cells are growing, they're eating up all the nutrients and they're secreting waste and that stresses them out. And when those cells age like that, they just don't take up these stains normally. They just don't, they're, they're growing old, they're dying. So they don't take up stain evenly. Now, what do I do if I see that on a slide and I'm supposed to determine gram status? The way I report it is by saying, cannot determine, cannot determine gram status. Nope, because I see that weird mixed staining result. Now, sometimes you get a real obvious slide like this one, cannot determine gram status. Sometimes it's a little less obvious. Take a look at this one. I can see circles on this slide. I hope you can too. These are cocci. They are definitely grouped together, aren't they? There are very few individual cells. Here's one individual cell. Here's one. Here's two side by side. Uh, here's one right there. So I can tell the shape. But when I examine this for color, this gets very hard. This also happens to be an old culture. Now, one of the giveaways for old culture, as I said a minute ago, is the spores. But this is an organism that doesn't sporulate. So there's no spores present on this slide. But I do see some material I don't expect to see. I've got some big blob of something right there, right? I've got a, some more dark colored material here and here. There's something really dark right here and right here. There's some debris on this slide. Anytime you see material that's not cellular, you can refer to that as, a, as debris. It doesn't look like all the other cells on the slide. Now, if you looked at this and you told me, I can see purple circles and I can see pink circles, you're exactly right. And you would be forgiven as a student if you said, gee, maybe there are two organisms on this slide. Maybe there's a gram positive caucus and a gram negative caucus. Cause I can see some pink circles like right there and I could see some more pink right in the middle here and up here, but I can also see definite purple circles. So maybe I have two organisms. Maybe I have a gram positive caucus and a gram negative caucus. In reality, this is an old culture. So this is one organism. Some of the cells are staining purple, some are staining pink you cannot determine the gram status from that smear because you get that weird staining result. Now, I wouldn't give you a slide like that one and ask you what the gram status is because that one would be too hard. 
but I would like you to um, look at that picture with the rods and the spores and really try to understand that when I see one type of cell, like a rod, picking up partial pink and partial purple staining, I can't determine the gram status from that. I just can't. All right, so the number one limitation is the old cultures. We just shouldn't gram stain old cultures. You're gonna get inconsistent staining across the smear. You're gonna get individual cells that pick up both colors. Remember, bacillus and clostridium genuses will tend to sporulate as they get older. So we sometimes see the spores. They don't pick up stain. So that's the biggest issue right there. But there is one other limitation I want you to be familiar with, and that's this one. Gram stains have expiration dates. All stains do actually. So in the laboratory, whenever you get ready to gram stain something, you have to check your expiration dates on your bottles of stain. Now this is a good practice for any chemical in the laboratory. You should always look to see when it expires. In fact, it's a good idea to circle the expiration date because you don't wanna use things that are expired. They don't work as well. And the same is true for stains. Old stains should be thrown out. Old expired stains should be thrown out. Remember, hazardous waste for stains. Fresh stains are the best. We wanna use nice fresh cells and we wanna use nice fresh stains and we'll get the very best gram staining results we can get. All right, here's one for you. This is a clinical specimen. So again, this came from a patient. This patient went into the doctor's office. This material was collected. Take a look at this. Now, again, patient sample, body fluid. You can definitely tell that there's some pinkish color in the background here, can't you? In fact, there's some debris on this slide. There's some pink sort of stringy looking material on this slide that are not cells. The cells are here. These are cells. All right. So what is the gram status of these cells? The doctor would like to know. He gathered this sample from a patient and he sent it into the lab and you're the technician. You made the smear and you heat fixed it and you gram stained it and this is what you got. What are you gonna tell that doctor? What's the gram status of that organism? Go ahead and type it right into the chat for me. Morgan's got it. Anybody else? Let's look at it again. Here are the cells right here. Cells here, cells here, cells, cells. What do you think? Good job, Sam. Remember, Sam, we always add in the cell shape too. What do you think about the shape of those cells? Look for an individual cell if you can see it. If you can't, look for the smallest number of cells you can find. There's two cells right here. There's two cells right here. Good, you got it, Sam. Gram positive cocci. That's the gram status of that organism. And this sample was taken out of the back of somebody's throat. <laughs> Somebody who went to the doctor because they had a terrible sore throat. And if you've ever had a 
streptococcus infection, you know that it's a very painful sore throat. The only good part about having strep throat is that there's a treatment for it, right? You get antibiotics for it. You tend to feel better really fast. So that's good. <laughs> but that's exactly what that is. It's a streptococcus. And it's is as you can see on the smear, it's forming chains. Not all the cells are forming chains, but a lot of them are forming these long chains. The circles are, are lining up head to tail, forming these chains. That's a feature that we tend to see with streptococcus. Good, good job. All right. So the next time we get together before I um, set you free tonight, the next time we get together is next week. Now, you don't have any Zoom lab on Thursday this week. It was just today's lab this week. And next week, you have a lab practical on Tuesday. Any of the days that you have lab practical exams, we don't meet for lab. When you have lecture exams, we do meet for lab. But when you have lab practical exams, we don't. So next Tuesday, well, first of all, Thursday, no lab. Tuesday, no lab. So I won't see you again until a week from Thursday. Make sure you've got it jotted down somewhere that you'll be taking the lab practical on Tuesday. It'll look very similar to um, what you saw with the lecture exam in that you can take the lab practical anytime from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. You just want to get it to me by 8 p.m. Now, does anybody have any questions about what we talked about today? Any questions about any of the gram staining chemicals? Any questions about the procedure, um, how we heat fix? Um, any questions about how we read the slides? Anything at all? You can type it in the chat if you want. Um, hopefully it was um, straightforward. Um, again, gram staining, not a really hard procedure once you've done it a couple of times. The hardest part is that decolorizing. And once you've done it, once you've um, done that weird drip, drip, drip over the slide a couple of times, um, you'll get more confident with it. All right, well, listen, I appreciate you coming. And again, I apologize for any confusion I caused by messing with the schedule on Zoom. Um, I know some of you must have received like 10 um, notifications in a row. And I apologize for that, um, but I appreciate you coming. And um, if you have any questions that come up, um, just send me a message through Canvas. Um, keep up with your work. Um, you're doing a good job. And um, if you haven't already submitted your lecture exam today, um, be sure to get that to me this evening. Okay. All right. I will see you all later. Have Thank a good you. evening. Thank You're you. You're very welcome.